My name is Richard Wesley, and it's my privilege to be the pastor here at St. Bethlehem United Methodist Church. And I am excited that you're with us today. Today, in United Methodist world, we call this Umcor Sunday. Now, what that means is that churches all across the world are receiving offerings, special financial gifts for Umcor. UMCOR is the United Methodist Committee on Relief. Now, UMCOR, if you're not familiar with it, is the humanitarian relief and development arm of the United Methodist Church. I'll read you what, uh, what our websites even say to talk about UMCOR. UMCOR works with vulnerable communities to strengthen self-sufficiency and encourage partnerships respond to United States and international disasters, addresses diseases of poverty, minister to refugees and immigrants, provide clean water, and actively work to reduce hunger. Now, in 2019, our effort for this special offering uh, was uh, uh, totaled $2,709,028. A lot of you contributed to that because our church received uh, offerings and sent that to uh, Encore last year. And so we're doing that again this year. We do it every year. So anything that you give between now and Easter Sunday, Mark Encore, we will send that in as, as one offering to Encore. Uh, of course, if you mark an offering any time of the year to Umcor, we send that to Umcor. That we don't receive, we don't use any of that money locally. That goes straight to Umcor. And this offering allows the United Methodist Church to send response teams anywhere in the world with no administrative costs. So if you give, let's say you gave to a special offering to Umcor knowing that we're in Texas right now, because of the, of the disaster as a result of the, of the winter uh, weather there, uh, our UMCOR folks are on the ground still working with those communities to help them survive and, and come out of this disaster. If you sent $100 for that effort, $100 is used on the ground. So uh, uh, that's, a, that's an important part of our UMCOR. So if you would like to give to this special offering, you can use our text to give. That's 931-286-7905. And 100% of everything coming through text to give between now and uh, Easter, that will be April the 4th, will go straight to that Encore offering. You can also give to the Encore uh, mission uh, through our website, uh, stbumc.com and go to the online giving and be sure you mark that for Encore. You'll, you're, uh, you'll see that you're, you, can, you can do that as you're uh, giving through the online. Or we still receive checks. You can mail a check to uh, St. St. B. UMC 2201 Old Russellville Pike and the zip code for that is 37040. Make sure you make the check out to St. Bethlehem, but uh, on the four line, mark Umcor, so that we put all of that money together and send one check then to the Umcor uh, mission. Now, I've got some exciting news to share with all of us. I have been so looking forward to being able to make this announcement that, um, well, let me just make it. Next week, next Sunday morning, the 21st, March 21, 9 a.m., we return to in-person worship here at St. Bethlehem United Methodist Church. And I am so thrilled that we're getting to do that. So, so let, me, let me make sure you understand what that means. On Sunday mornings from now on, 9 a.m., we will have our regular in-person worship service. That's when we've had it in the past, as we're continuing to have it at 9 a.m. in the future. We will still be having our 10 a.m. Zoom Room devotional. And we will still have our 11 a.m. premiere of this YouTube worship experience. 
experience. None of that goes away. None of that changes. We're just adding back in the Sunday morning in-person worship service. And so you're welcome to join us in those if you're ready to come back for in-person worship. Now, what that also means is that our Good Friday service will be in person. So in, during Holy Week, uh, the Good Friday service will be held in person here in and, and, and our uh, uh, worship space at 6 p.m. Now, today, we're looking at how do you take the Bible verse, John 3, 16, which is probably the most popular, well-known Bible verse in the Bible, how do you take that verse from a bumper sticker mentality? You see it held up on signs at ball games, and, and, and the question today is, how do you take it from just a bumper sticker mentality to a real program of the church and the people committed to Jesus Christ? I'm glad you're with us today as we look at from snakes to salvation. lesson this morning is from the Hebrew Bible, what we call the Old Testament, from the 21st chapter of Numbers. From Mount Hor, they set out by the way to the Red Sea, to go around the land of Edom. But the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there, has, there is no food and no water and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent out poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it on a pole. And whenever a serpent bit someone, the person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. Our gospel lesson this morning is from uh, the third chapter of John. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him 
may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did what God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the Son of God, the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and the people love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. The words of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Welcome to the fourth Sunday in Lent. I trust your experience in a holy Lent filled with struggle and victory, desert and oasis. You see, this is a season for the church that lends itself to that kind of duality. So, in the midst of such duality, it is a wonderful season to have the Gospel of John highlighted. Many Christians hold John's Gospel to be their favorite. John's Gospel is filled with duality, contrasting metaphors of light and dark, good and evil, spiritual and physical, life and death. And in the midst of all of this, comes the most famous Bible verse of all, John 3, 16. But John 3, 16 is also, I believe, the most abused Bible verse of all. Being taken out of context to be watered down as a slogan or a bumper sticker or spray painted on a sheet to be held up at football games rather than a real program for the church and the Christians to follow. Notice the context this morning. Our author points back to the story of Moses. This is the context of John 3.16. Did you notice the context when Robert read that story about God and their leader Moses? The people were complaining. God sends poisonous snakes as a punishment. Now, the snakes were biting the people, and the people were dying. It's a phenomenal story, and I, I wish we had time to explore it this morning. And for those of you who enjoy digging deeply into our scriptural stories, let me point you on a path to deeper insight at least for the way John understands this Moses story. John places this Moses story in the middle of a metaphoric duality to help create an understanding of truths beyond the physical realm or things we might call real. You might want to further examine this story for its metaphoric and symbolic truths relating to the kingdom of God. So, Moses molds a snake out of bronze and attaches it to a pole. If the pole was lifted up, anyone dying from the poisonous snake bites could look at the pole with the serpent on it and be saved. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man, Jesus, be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him may have eternal life. Now, as a reminder to keep us on track today, eternal life, or zoe in the Greek, is something you have right now, or you don't. It is not something you receive when you die. 
You don't lose it when you die, but you either have it right now or you don't have it. So, John's gospel informs us Jesus must be lifted up on a cross, and whoever lives their lives based on Jesus will have this joy-filled life we call eternal. If you believe in Jesus or live into Jesus, live into the lifestyle that Jesus lived, then you have eternal life. If you do not yet live into Jesus, you have death or darkness or separation from God. This is John's theme, the whole gospel. Light came into the world through Jesus, but some continued to live in darkness. Then, with the Moses story firmly planted in our minds, John says, For God so loved the world that God gave the world Jesus, the Son of God, so that everyone who believes in him or lives into him might not perish, but have this joy-filled life we call eternal. Again, notice the contrast. A life that is perishing or a life that is joy-filled that we call eternal. And please notice what God loves. For God so loved the world. Now, the Greek word used by the author of John's Gospel, translated world, is the Greek word cosmos. The cosmos is all of creation. Everything that God created is the cosmos. For God so loved everything that God created that God sent Jesus. Jesus was born because God loves all creation. If God loves all of creation, enough to send Jesus to save all of creation, shouldn't we also love all creation? Shouldn't the children of God love what God loves? And if we love what God loves, shouldn't we take care of what God loves? Indeed, John continues, God did not send uh, the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. God did not send Jesus into the cosmos, into what God has created to condemn what God has created, but so that all that God has created might be saved, redeemed, loved, and cared for. According to John's dualism, all of creation is redeemed through Jesus. Salvation is not only for humans, but extends outward to all that is created. Now, I, I know there is this modern concept in some of our Western Christianity that the earth will be destroyed and a new heaven and a new earth will be created. But such an understanding comes from taking biblical passages out of their original context and dropping them into our 21st century world. That concept comes out of the book of Revelation, which is the last book in our uh, Christian scriptures, the New Testament. So it comes out of the Revelation, and that book is written in what is called the apocalyptic literature style. We no longer use the apocalyptic writing style and sometimes the symbolism is hard to follow. 
In fact, it takes several Bible study class sessions to explore the nuances of apocalyptic literature style. But I think one example will help us understand this better this morning. In the writings of the Apostle Paul, he talks about us, followers of Jesus, becoming new creatures or new creations in Christ. This is also apocalyptic literary style of writing. Paul says the old has passed away, and behold, all things have become new. Paul says we have died, and we are raised to new life in Christ Jesus. All of this is apocalyptic imagery. This is the same imagery used in the Revelation's account of the earth passing away and then becoming new. The new creation of Revelation's earth is the same as our new creation of becoming new creatures in Christ. It is redemption or salvation. This, John says, is why Jesus was born. So John affirms, God did not send Jesus into the world to condemn the world, but that all creation might be saved because of Jesus. So, how can we take John 3.16 from bumper sticker mentality to making it a real program for the church and followers of Jesus? Well, for starters, we could identify what God loves. According to John's Gospel, God loves all of creation, enough to send Jesus. How does our lifestyles and ministries as a Christian community and as followers of Jesus show love for all of God's created order, for all humans, for all animals and plant life, for pure water and vibrant forests? Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Jesus. Those who believe in him or live into him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Then, John gives us his view of what judgment is. Did you notice that? It's the very next verses. And this is the judgment. That the light has come into the world and people loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen in their deeds, so it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. The motivation for their deeds is God, and God is love. Love motivates the deeds of God's people. John is very clear here. Loving what God loves and living out that love or doing good deeds, as, uh, as John puts it in, in his story, does not save you. But for those who are saved, this becomes their lifestyle so that it may be clearly seen in their deeds that these things have been done in the love of God. Let us pray. O oh Lord, we give thanks to you, for you are good. Your steadfast love endures forever. We, whom you have redeemed from trouble, have gathered from all the lands of the earth and we offer our praise and sing glory to your holy name, which is high above all. 
You love the world so much that you gave your only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Your light has come into the world, but continuing our evil deeds, we act as though we love the darkness. Do not condemn us, O merciful God, but forgive our iniquity and invite us once again to live in that salvation which you offer so freely. By grace, we have been saved through faith and have been given the privilege of spreading the good news of the immeasurable riches of your grace. Send us out with the power of your Holy Spirit that all may boast of your great power and love. From the earliest days of your covenant, your will for the healing of the world has been made manifest. This day there are some who are sick, others who are near the gates of death. Lord, send forth your word and heal them. Deliver them from destruction that they and we may thank you. Hear and answer us, not because of our works, but in the name of Jesus the Lord. Amen. <laughs>
we take John 3.16 from bumper sticker mentality to making it a real program for the church and followers of Jesus? Well, for starters, we can identify what and who God loves. Then, let's take the next step, examine our own attitudes and our actions. Do we not only love what God loves and love who God loves, but do our actions and do it?